Hello, Internet, and welcome to episode two of On War the Podcast. My name's Alistair, and I'm joined once again by my good friend and colleague Austin. And in this episode, we're taking a look at democratic peace theory, the idea that modern democracies don't make war on each other. So I guess before we get started, there's going to be some key ideas in international relations that some of our listeners aren't going to be familiar with. And we should probably cover them just so people don't get lost in the fray. So central to this is is different ideas of how countries and international organizations operate in world politics. And there's sort of two competing ideas here, or two main competing ideas here. The first, sort of perhaps the more conventional, would you say the more conventional for realism, Austin? I Yes, I would certainly say that realism is the more conventional. Yeah, it's, it's certainly been the, the, it was the dominant idea for a very long time in the first half of the 20th century, I'd say, uh, and continues to be quite relevant, is the realists, the, the school of realism. Their idea is that states are the fundamental actors in world politics. That is, they're the the primary movers and shakers. It's states that have the um, the most power. Uh, they're able to affect the world in the most ways, and that they will act purely in their own self-interest to maximize their own um, resources, their own gains, whatever political or economic, whatever they may be, and that above that level. Because they're all capable of acting independently, because there's no sort of overarching body that overlooks that, that this, above the level of the state, the term's a Hobbesian state of nature. It's, it's, it's anarchy. It's country upon country with no, with any, without any real rule of international law becoming effective enough to control it. And this is certainly the attitude you see displayed in some states. What's the competing ideal? The directly competing ideal, and this is where democratic peace process comes from is liberalism. By this, we don't mean liberalism in its domestic political context. What we're talking about when we speak about liberalism is the concept that states will work together in order to maximise their ability to achieve their interests by creating a stable uh, platform or stage that works on a given set of agreed rules. These rules are overseen by multi-state bodies that support and represent reasonably fairly the interests of all parties concerned. Now, liberalism does not take into account your non-state actors, but its key differential is this concept that the background is cooperative, or at least non-competitive, rule structure as opposed to the anarchy we see in realism. Yeah, and this comes out of uh, the post-World War II environment. We started seeing these um, international organizations being formed along these lines. Of course, the biggest and most obvious would be the United Nations, but the International Monetary Fund, um, the World Trade Organization, and a whole host, ASEAN, NATO, a whole host of these other different organizations are clearly built around liberalist ideals and as you said one of the things that comes out of this is this idea of a a democratic peace process it's a direct challenge to the realist ideal of anarchy by saying look democracies don't go to war with each other and in fact some scholars including levy go as far as to say that the the absence of war and conflict between democracies is as close to anything as an empirical law as you could find in international relations and of course, they're looking at the, the post World War II environment when they say that. So, what are some of the key assumptions? Why is it that people believe, or uh, that particularly these theorists believe, that democracies don't go to war with each other or are less capable of it? Well, the underlying assumption is that, and this comes from Enlightenment philosophy, is the concept that as the, the abstract civilization has developed, that it's natural or it's pure political structure is the constituent or liberal democracy. In other words, it's arguing or it's assuming that democracies are the true expression of human attainment. And this is because their legitimacy as states 
their ability to function, their ability to exercise their power as states is directly derived in theoretical terms from the will of the people that constitute that state. In more sort of precise everyday terms, to go to war, you need to be able to win the next election. You need to have the electoral consent of the people to engage in and maintain uh, any kind of ongoing conflict. And the general assumption is people on the whole don't want to go to war. Exactly. And it, that is the theoretical belief. And that's what that assumption underpins this. And therefore, what it creates is a system where democracies as a form of governance is secured and sanctified as the only true expression of the will of the people because they're not theoretically prone to violence. And of course, this, as you say, this projects upwards, and this is where it carries on the liberalist ideal that there's this mutual respect between democracies. If you are internally legitimate, then you project to other democracies this external legitimacy. You are a stable, sovereign government, governing in the way that is pure and good and right, and thus it, there's supposed to be more realm for conciliation and negotiation rather than resorting to all-out conflict. It stems partly from your medieval concept of Christendom, in that violence is only tolerated, violence is only justified on the behalf of the state against those state and non-state actors that are condemned as being outside the legitimate system. So those states that operate on the non-Western democratic system, those who are outside the tent, so to speak. And this is sort of our first big criticism about de democratic peace theory, isn't it? Is this idea that, sure, modern democracies don't go to war with each other, but when you start saying that, you, who are you excluding? And the, the, the immediate kind of obvious answer is the same people that have been deemed the barbarians or the outsiders or the uncivilized or the colonials or the what have you all through time. By saying that you can have an, um, an unjust war against democracies, or rather that you won't have an unjust war against democracies, you're sort of tacitly implying that you're willing to do it for, for other reasons. And although we might couch it in this wonderful term of spreading democracy, what you're really saying is you're legitimizing an ability to preserve a, a perception of the westernized world order, aren't you? Absolutely. The core of this theory is a way to legitimize and sanctify one version of the world order. And as part of that, the flip side, and this is what you're talking about, Alastair, is that by comparison, those that are outside the tent, so to speak, those who exist outside the perceived international order, are deemed to be less than, underdeveloped, backward. And so we see them be targeted for any, any form of what... Evans calls liberal violence, liberal war, which is not necessarily war as we would look at it, but is very much based on violence that is justified partly by not being against the epitome or those inside the system. Right. And there's a whole school of uh, international theory that looks at this in post-colonial studies, that the whole idea is uh, examining how previously colonial nations, the typical ones being... Um, Western Europe, and France, and England in particular, but also in America's attitudes towards the Middle East and Latin America, looking at how those countries have found different policies in an era of supposed self-determination uh, and liberalism, found new ways to project power against them. And the, their key critic of this democratic peace process, exactly for this reason. Part of that reason is what this theory creates and what it represents. And this is, again, feeds up into liberalism as a view of international relations. What it reinforces is really a, a biopolitical Foucauldian view. What we're looking at here is a system where states truly become, and they act almost like an organic body would, in that they, they exercise violence against those that they view as a threat or they view as different from their homogenous existence, politically speaking. And that then is used to justify biologically through the suppression of risk, the activities of potential rivals or potential threats. And this is a, a vast oversimplification. And if you want to read more on this 
you should certainly go and read Foucault's later works from Society Must Be Defended onwards. Yeah, you see this in a lot of the discourse surrounding modern terrorism, and this is something we're going to go into a little later, but to give people context, because Foucault is something that I struggle with, um, when you see language uh, shaped around a conflict, that it's they threaten our very way of life. They're attacking us in our home. You know, this this is reshaping how people are thinking, not in terms of broad countries or politics, but it's making it personal. And, you know, it's attacking our way of life, our living, our you know, biological essence in a very philosophical way. I will, by the way, link in the show notes on our um, blog uh, a couple of very good intro to uh, Foucault for people who are interested, because it is very hard to get into and it would be an entire episode on a different podcast all of itself i think what we're seeing really to take it back into the theory a little bit is this a stratification of society and it used to be along ideological and nationalist lines but we're increasingly saying is this it's real it is that personal almost racial belief a tribalism almost is formed between us and those we view as similar to ourselves Basically, under this theory and under liberal structures, the overriding security concern is from those radically different styles or functional governments that govern life in other states. That's viewed as the key strategic risk. And there we are linked on the blog to an article from Tony Blair, who's the former Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, on this very issue where he speaks about this and speaks about how... He, his view is that a large portion of why we are threatened by these smaller states, these non-liberal Western states, is that their different way of life or different political structure creates ills within that state, which are then exported to the liberal states who must secure themselves as, again, an oversimplification, the immune system of a body would in order to keep out what it views as threats from the outside that would infect it. Yeah, it's it's actually quite an undeveloped area of security relations, um, looking at how that kind of biopower response occurs, and it's certainly something we're both looking into heavily in our work. But there's another side to this too. I mean, we've sort of, we've talked about how the unsaid areas of this theory creates opportunity for big politics, if you like, the the... The, the great game of international relations. But what about the other side of it? Do democracies really not go to war with each other? Some of the things I'm thinking of here is, is perhaps not as we, would defi- as we were talking about last episode with the definition of war as a thousand battlefield casualties or less, but democracies have proven time and again able to interfere with each other, particularly if you look at the American foreign policy in Latin America in the height of the Cold War and as well as their actions in supporting the coup against the democratically elected uh, government in Iran in 1953. They're very capable of, of, democracies are very capable of taking other actions and that sort of undermines that idea of, of, of mutual respect and legitimacy, isn't it? If you, you won't go to war but you can set up Pinochet in, in Chile in 1973. Absolutely. And we we have seen um, quite substantial, particularly from the U.S. and particularly in South America, um, use of economic influence um, as well as small-scale military force in order to exert influence and to attack other states. Now, and this is part, this goes back a little bit to the Foucauldian example. A lot of this is based largely in discourse. So democratic peace theory holds that because, and this is the crucial part here, it's because of the influence of the populace as the sovereign decision maker that democratic states don't go to war with each other. So the influence of discourse is vastly increased under this theorem because it doesn't actually matter what the reality is in that state because, and Chile is a perfect example of a democratically elected government that was overthrown through military force. Somalia is another example, um, particularly if you look at the, the former Soviet-supported um, movement and then the United Court, Islamic Courts, which were overthrown by US-supported Ethiopian invasion in 2006. 
it's less about the actual functional aspect of government, in my opinion, than what you can convince your populace they are. If you can convince them they aren't a liberal democratic society or they, they don't match the values and therefore they are separate from our societal body, then they are no longer covered by this theorem. It's not so much that no democracy will go to war with another democracy. It's that no two mutually recognising liberal democracies would go to war with one another. It's about removing that recognition, and then they can go to war, or in the case you refer to, conduct military or economic undermining in order to increase instability and arrival. Yeah, and this is, again, the fine lines between what is a war and what is not is is often how these things skate through the liberalist institutions that we have set up. Going back to last episode, the, the problem of defining a conflict is is very small, and, and in the cases we're talking about here, of course, at the time, these were highly covert operations. It's only after um, the fact that they came to light how much Western involvement had been. And so, again, you... It's a, it really does subvert that idea of, of mutual cooperation and respect that, that democratic peace theory in its sort of liberalist intent is supposed to encapsulate. So again, when we're looking at how people can be convinced and how propaganda or even just general sentiment can maintain an inertia, there's another example that sort of subverts the, the kind of at least paper definition of, of, of democratic peace theory from 1923. This was when the French actually deployed military force to occupy the Ruhr region uh, in response to the, the Weimar Republic's failure to continue its reparation payments after the end of the First World War. So for those who aren't aware, after the, part of the, the peace process of the end of the First World War involved uh, Germany paying various payments to all sorts of countries that had been involved in, particularly France, and, of course, in the wake of the Great Depression and an economic downturn and the, the slow boil of fascism in, in Germany, those payments were stopped. Um, the response was that for France was to deploy troops to the Ruhr region um, to occupy it. And, and, in fact, it was the pursuit of an original war goal to annex that region. And it's it never escalated at that point to a war, but there were certainly small-scale skirmishes that occurred throughout the area during this time. And it, kind of key to the paper definition of democratic peace theory is that this is the deployment of military force to another nominally democratic country. So it's, it's hitting both these notes that we're talking about. One, that the popular demand, and, and this is sort of, like I said, this is a continuation of existing war goals in, First world, in the First World War they weren't able to achieve. And obviously there's a huge... Um, anti-German sentiment still within the French as an outcrop of the war, but also a very kind of on-paper slap in the face of, of, of those key definitional points. It's, it's military force being deployed against another democratic country. So this brings us to, I guess, the other part that I want to talk about here, which is that perhaps this is what we're seeing, or what our democratic peace theorists are seeing is, is in fact something else. Since the 1950s, there hasn't been a big, a big war, so to speak. Not on the scale of, of the previous European conflicts, both before and including the First and Second World Wars. Of course, there's a, a whole raft of conflicts, the Napoleonic Wars, which you're very familiar with as well before that. But after World War II, or perhaps after, arguably after Korea is a better point, we see a decline in those great, the, the great wars, the great nation on nation wars. And so it's quite easy to look at that in the context, perhaps, of the European wars and say that things have changed, but maybe they're seeing something different. I don't know. What are your thoughts on that? I think it's certainly worth worth looking at. But I, I do think, though, that we, we've had examples of, of democracies fighting other d liberal democracies since the end of the Korean War. It's not on a similar scale. I mean, Australia and Indonesia have been fighting on and off. Now, in terms of your... Napoleonic Wars, you had a similar argument being, happening there between what should be allied European powers who would fight each other and, and quite often fight themselves. 
The ideological framework for that, though, was based largely on artificially induced conflict. So we see the first issues of propaganda and things. So I don't think that the Napoleonic Wars in general would apply to democratic peace theory as a direct correlation, mostly because there were other aspects in play. Speaking about the underlying concern being um, targeting those who are outside this liberal world order, that is certainly evident in the Napoleonic Wars and the targeting of the Ottomans and the Russians. And it, but equally, you do have you know the precursor to the World Trade Organization and the continental system. So I think if you pick any war, any period of time, and this to tie it back to your point, I think you pick any period of time, not just the modern era, and argue that there are points both for and against this concept of democratic peace theory, you just have to change whether you're talking about democracy or whether you're talking about the current dominant political ideology of the time period you're talking about. But doesn't that in of itself subvert the whole concept? I mean, if it's stemming from this pure liberalist ideal, isn't the fact that you can just change it to being a way of excluding and, and reprimanding or perhaps bringing those outside the fold back into it, doesn't that actually sort of undermine itself in its own stated goals? Even if we can twist it and see how it might apply in, in through a different lens, doesn't that sort of undermine itself? Absolutely. It certainly does. But the point is, and I think that it's really easy to look at a... It's not just democratic peace theory. Any broad-scale theoretical approach that attempts to answer the question about why states choose sanctions or non-violent methodology over war is never going to be fully applicable. Now, I think the democratic peace theory is less reflective of the facts than some of the other theories that are out there. But I don't think that you can discount it entirely. Despite the fact that you're 100% right, it has been used in practice to exclude rather than prevent war. I think it's used to justify a system that is exclusionary as opposed to preventing war within states that occupy that system. And it is useful to provide a sort of a, an ideal to work towards. I mean, the centerpiece of most liberal organizations, and particularly if you look at the United Nations, which in my eyes is quite an admirable, if hamstrung, organization, is the promotion of self-determination and of peaceful resolutions. And so this idea, in its theoretical um, terms, to promote democracy and therefore peace is not necessarily of itself a bad thing, but perhaps it's wishful thinking? Certainly. I think that, you know, looking at even the laws of armed conflict are predicated on the influence of states believing in a liberal system, states believing in the system, and more importantly, the bureaucrats believing in the influence of this liberal system. And democratic peace theory is a expression of that belief, in my opinion, regardless of its effectiveness in explaining to scholars why states don't conduct open hostilities. I think that's much less relevant, and I don't think you can discount the theory because it does have, as you mentioned, real benefits. And a key one is the fact that people abide by the rules of war and are willing to work towards the ideal it espouses by committing troops and more, more regularly an issue, committing money to peacekeeping or less justifiably peace enforcement operations, which under a realist system simply would not occur. A useful fiction then, perhaps. That would certainly be my way of putting it. I, I'm definitely in agreement with you on that. I would go a little bit further, though, and say that I think that some of the proponents of this theory and some of the assumptions of this theory do miss the point in that war and conflict, at least in the last 20, 30 years, or, in, no, I go further, I'd say in the post-career environment, uh, is fundamentally changing. I mean, look at what other countries we, on paper, don't go to war with. I'm thinking in particular of the West's key strategic rivals, China and Russia. 
Now certainly we get involved in proxy conflicts, uh, we get involved in economic sanctions. Um, in many ways these are sort of liberal ways of doing conflict, but they're not they're not what you would conceive of as a modern Western democracy at the very least. Um, certainly in the case of China, there's a lot of questions that are often asked about that. But we still, we're not prepared to go to war with them. I mean, the economic cost alone would be enormous. No, but I think it's a useful fiction. Again, what you're looking at here is a system that is defined by its exclusions to a much greater extent than its inclusions. I mean, if you look up the definition of a liberal democracy, the key features, at least on paper, can be found in almost anything that calls itself a democracy or a republic or anything of the sort. What we're doing is we're creating an environment, a structure, that is defined, in my opinion, based on who's in and who's out. And you're 100% right. Our key strategic rivals at the moment are out of the system. The Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, for example, the Iranians are another one. Even the whole term coined, I believe, during the Bush administration, the axis of evil, you know, is a lurid but effective demonstration of what I'm talking about here. Yeah, it, defining the other, the enemy, those not like us, and then justifying action against them. But that action doesn't have to necessarily be war. And I think that's the key point where we're seeing the geopolitics at the moment is that Democratic war, democratic peace theory allows Western democracies to increase their own legitimacy on the world stage by portraying themselves as enlightened, as moving past conflict, at least with each other, others who have reached that pinnacle of civilization, so to speak. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to ever go to war with those we consider our, our enemies or those who are outside the tent. It just creates an other. And the best thing about an other is that they create fear. And that is the role that the Chinese and the Russians are so graciously playing in this system. We're starting to run out of uh, time now. So I guess final points about democratic peace theory. It's far from, I would say it's absolutely far from anything close to a law in international relations. In fact, I think we've both agreed that if anything, it's a, a, a useful fiction depending on the proponent, a, uh, a wishful ideal. Do you have any other closing comments? I, I would certainly agree with you there that it, it really is a, a, a legal fiction. Um, I'm not sure I go so far as a, a wishful um, thought. But, uh, yeah, I, I do think that this will continue to come up as we move through the, the episodes of the podcast. Um, it's useful to look at it as a foundation that, influences the thought process of key decision makers within the states we're looking at when they make decisions on conflict. And that's the key to many of the ideas we'll be exploring throughout the series. Ultimately, the theories we look at are at least as important in the way they influence those decision makers and theorists as they are for explaining their actions. That's all we've got time for today, though, so thank you very much for listening. If you've enjoyed the show and would like to support us directly, please consider visiting our Patreon page. The support of our patrons goes a long way to improving the quality of the show from the source material we use to the equipment we record with. Of course, as always, the best and simplest ways you can support us is to simply share this podcast with your friends, students or colleagues, whoever you might think enjoy it, and by sending us your feedback. If you want further reading or would like to send us your thoughts, please visit our blog at www.onwarthepodcast.wordpress.com. Join us next week as we resume our regular schedule to explore the not-wars of peacekeeping, police actions, and covert acts that nevertheless constitute political violence in the modern world. Once again, thank you for listening, and good night.